Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Today's presentation features Sam Darwish, experienced CT and MRI senior engineer at Technical Prospects. Sam has been in the medical imaging industry for more than 20 years with industry-leading CT and MRI manufacturers, as well as major independent service organizations worldwide. This webinar will provide an opportunity to learn or brush up on an overview of computed tomography principles. Before we begin, Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Technical Prospects. Technical Prospects' mission is to provide the global medical imaging community pre-owned OEM quality standard imaging parts at less than OEM pricing with an honest, and consistent reputation due to quality shipping, friendly service, and knowledgeable staff. They live and breathe Siemens. It's their core and their future. Meticulous parts, quality assurance, backed by rock solid training and above and beyond support, all from a single source. If that sounds unique in the industry, that's because it is. For more information, please visit technicalprospects.com. Let's give one lucky attendee the opportunity to win a Webinar Wednesday webinar t-shirt by answering the following question. What city and state is home to the headquarters of Technical Prospects? You can find the answer on our sponsor's website, and you can answer by using the questions feature on your webinar dashboard. As a reminder, the MD Expo Tampa will kick off in 11 days. MD Expo Tampa has been approved for up to 13 CEUs by the ACI. We are thrilled to bring this one-of-a-kind conference back to the HTM industry, and there is still time to register online at mdexposhow.com. If you are unable to join us in Tampa for the MD Expo, be sure not to miss out on our December HTM Mixer in Nashville, Tennessee on December 9th and 10th. Please visit htmmixer.com for more details on this event. As always, today's webinar is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. You can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. More details on this at the end of today's webinar. We will wrap up today's presentation with a live Q&A. You can submit your questions anytime during the webinar by using the questions feature on your webinar dashboard. We will get through as many attendee questions as time allows. Before we begin the presentation, a few words from Andrew Cluck. Digital Marketing Manager at Technical Prospects. Andy, you may begin whenever you are ready. Awesome. Thank you very much for the introduction today. And uh, Technical Prospects is excited to be a part of this. And I know Sam's looking forward to talking to you all, so I'll be pretty brief. Um, I know she already gave you a brief introduction to us, but as a reminder for those who are unfamiliar with us, Technical Prospects, we specialize in providing those medical imaging solutions for Siemens med medical imaging equipment parts training, then we also do technical support and service. Our business is family owned. Uh, we've been in business for over 20 years with over 100 years of combined medical imaging experience. We provide OEM and pre owned quality assured certified Siemens parts at substantial cost savings over OEM. Our focus and expertise is Siemens X ray, CT. MRI and other uh, modalities, including cath angio as well. So we have a state-of-the-art 72,000 square foot facility and we're located in Appleton, Wisconsin. Our facility offers high-tech offices with 60,000 square feet of warehouse space. Um, and then uh, we have 12,000 dedicated just to training and quality assurance testing. So we have training, we offer two 
large classrooms with 17 operational bays where you actually get to work hands-on the equipment. Um, our classes offer over 75% hands-on training experience. And this year we brought on MRI, which Sam is actually one of the instructors for both MRI and CT. So um, that I'd like to introduce today's speaker. So Sam Darwish, as we introduced, is our senior CT MRI engineer and uh, the head of our training at Technical Prospects. So Sam's been in the medical imaging industry for 20 plus years, and he works with leading CT and MRI manufacturers, as well as major independent service organization or ISOs. Um, Sam has extensive experience working in all aspects of medical, uh, including CT and MRI engineering and level three lead technical support. So. He dedicates his time to providing expert recommendations to his team of engineers in North and South America and was also responsible for major strategic projects on CT and MRI systems worldwide. Sam is also an adjunct professor of medical imaging, providing focus on design and functional performance of the medical equipment, as well as consistent image quality, which we all know is extremely important. So Sam does hold a bachelor's degree of electrical engineering and a master's degree from the University of Texas. Sam in his free time enjoys cooking, hiking, swimming, and mountain biking with Joaquina and their two kids, Sarah Elizabeth and Jude Aaron. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sam to share with you all on his presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it and thanks for having me here. Um, this presentation is actually focused on a very important term that we use in the industry from radiologists, technologists, engineers to biomed specialists. We always hear the word CAD scan. So let's go ahead and learn a little bit more about that CAD. So in this presentation, we'll discuss the overview of the medical purpose and use of a CT system. We'll look at a high level overview of the CT modality, and we will learn about the principles of the CT operation. We will take a historical development of the CT scanner overview over the last five generations. We will speak about the differential characteristics of CT versus conventional X-ray. We will review a chest scan, an AP school, and the lateral school. We will chat a little bit about technical prospects training overview. And if the time permitting, we will take an actual clinical studies that show the impact of CT scan. So often we hear the word modality. What actually mean by modality? When we say CT is a modality and MR is a modality, and what the word modality mean? Modality, it's a device or a method that does not provide cure to the patient. Actually, it's a therapeutic method that provide data and a physical diagnostic that physician can interpret so they can understand more of the issue or the disease they are evaluating. So why CT as a modality get chosen over other modalities? The choice of utilizing the CT over other diagnostic modalities is driven by the following factor the presenting cause, the diagnostic standards or prescribed method of diagnostic, or the desired outcome or results. So often we hear in the industry that that particular institutes like to do a lot of CT scan. They prescribe CT studies for everybody. In fact, that not accurate. They use the CT for specific reasons and there are specific outcomes desired in order 
to issue a CT for a patient. So let's start with the actual acronym, what the word CT means. The word CT means completed tomography. That means a radiographic imaging process that use computers to generate an image of a tissue density and the slices through the patient body. So we are tomo, that means we are slicing through computation by using the computer. That's why it's a computed tomography. When we speak about CT and the idea of actually slicing the human body through images, that allows us to look inside the human body without invasive surgery. We always have to find two individuals who helped us get there. Sir Godfrey Hansfeld, the father of CT, and Alan Cormack, the father of imaging computation. Together, they were awarded the 1979 Nobel Prize for Medicine for the joint development of X-ray computed axial tomography. And that's the first time in this presentation we're actually mentioning the word CAT, computed axial tomography. Let's together learn more about the CAT. When we, when we say household unit, it's pretty much the soul of the CAT. That CT image is based on a comparison between the pre-existed pre radio density metrics of certain components and the actual measured tissue. So we used Sir Godfrey, last name, Hansville, in order to create a scale that we can understand the quantitative measure of radio density used to derive the grayscale values for the image bitmap of all CT image. Regardless of the manufacturer, regardless the year of manufacturing, regardless the number of slides, and regardless the tube age, fan beam, heat dissipation, or megawatts. Any CT scanner, if you take a picture of an error, it should read minus 1,000 Hansfeld units, and the water will read zero, and the kidney tissue will read 30, and so on and so forth, and the bone will read from the 700 to 3,000. That's pretty much what physicists do when they come to evaluate any scanner. They just measure the output of the scanner because Sir Godfrey Hansfeld helped us standardize radio density by creating the Hansfeld index or the Hansfeld scale. So what happened to the CAT scanner? Why everybody in a hospital today still experienced radiologists, technologists, engineers, technicians, biomed individuals, everybody say, oh, I was working in the CAT scan. It's the CAT scanner that's down. So we know for a fact that we are actually not scanning a CAT, neither in the paper scanner, nor an actual CAT that we are scanning in the CT scanner. Although the CT scanner is very efficient for a school of lion, matter of fact, there are studies about that. So, but that's not the reason that we call it CAT scanner. We actually call it CAT scanner because the very first computed tomography existed was able to produce images in the axial axis only. 
axial tomography is the only images we were able to get from the CAT scanner. Therefore, the CAT is actually stood for computed axial tomography. This term is now outdated, although we still collect the data in one axis, axial, but we actually can produce images in other axes as well. So the actual breakthrough is started when we were able to slice the image, look into the human body, and that slice, when you cut like you're cutting a bread, that slice is actually the axial axis of the object. So, is it inappropriate to say CAT scan? No, but it's inaccurate because the limitation already dissipated. We don't produce images just like this. To imagine the axial, and as you read images of CT, or if you are surfacing a CT, to imagine the axial, the loaf of bread is the best imagination. It's fact, maybe I'll think a lot about the bread, but the reality is that is how we look inside the human body. That is the axial plane. You always can produce images with the NOR scanner with other axes. What plane of a scan we actually have? We can now reconstruct images in a variety of anatomical planes. Axial or transverse plane, and that creates head and foot portion. That is the same axis that we collect the data with. That is the same plane to look into slides in the human body. There are also sagittal or lateral plane that we can create right and left portions with. And we also can use coronal or frontal plane and with that, we create the front and back portions. These are all reconstruction methods, but the data collection remain axial only. So back when they started making the overall concepts of CT, that's the only production they actually can have. They were able to have axial plane only. So the overall is actually axial images. There was no any other plane. The physicist and the radiologist had to actually imagine the sagittal plane. The sagittal plane was not reconstructed in the early scanners. In today's scanners, we actually can reconstruct using sagittal plane. So as coronal, all these planes used to be imagined by the radiologist because the only image they can get is axial. When the CT scan started, we were able to actually produce images in axial only. The rest have to be imagined. Now we can provide in all three different axes. So what's the principal operation 
of the computed tomography. It's very necessary to remember there are two primary steps to derive a CT image. We will need physical measurements of the attenuation of the X-ray beam passing through the patient in multiple direction. And we're gonna need a mathematical calculation of the linear coefficients for the multiple points within the field of exposures. Those linear coefficients, they're actually the creator of what we call CT slide. Let's look about the historical development from the first generation to the generation we have now. So when it's all started, it started in 1971. First, a clinical scanner was introduced, a dedicated head scanner produced by EMI. It requires the patient's head to be recessed into a rubber membrane coated water filled box. The patient head was recessed to a membrane that filled with water. And the reason we do that to maximize the attenuation, to ensure that we can capture the attenuated rays. And of course, that CT was head only. The tube and detector are physically linked and move in a linearly transverse scanner motion. That motion we used to call translation. The tube emitted a single narrow pencil with beam. There was no fan beam. That's the only X-ray beam we have. It's an actual pencil with X-ray beam. Once a full translation of the patient is completed, the entire apparatus rotates one degree and the entire process begins again. That function called translate rotate. This translate rotate process continues until the system has rotated 180 degrees. All that to produce just one slide. The reconstruction per slide took five minutes. So the total would be 15 hours for an entire 180 degree exam. The resolution was 128 by 128 bit image resolution. And then 1974 came, and we consider this revolutionary because now we don't have a pencil with X-ray beam. So we're improving by entering the second generation of computer tomography. We would not recess the human body to the table and then have green the we will not be scanning head only, rather we will go full body. So the introduction of first waterless full body scanner developed, produced by Ledley et al. at Georgetown University, introduced several new features that are now standard in current CT models. Table moved through the gantry, gantry angulation tilt become possible, and laser indicators for patient positioning. Relayed on first generation translate rotate scanning technology. The problem with the concept of translate rotate, it's time consuming. That means it would lead to unavoidable patient movements. And as all of us know here, patient movement mean artifact, poor image quality, noise in the image. 
So now we have three narrow beam in the second generation. And that X-ray concept known by the fan beam. And we have three detectors called second generation geometry. Each beam or detector pair was offsite from the next by one degree. So we have a 30 degree, 31, 32, so on and so forth. And that actually reduced the number of translation. When the number of translation reduced, that reduced the scan time. The continuous development led to the fan beam width increasing from three degree to 26 degree. And that when we have a wider X-ray fan beam, that means we can capture wider attenuation, then we need a wider detector. So the detectors increase from three to 30 detector. Now we are 20 second per image. Not like where we were with the five minutes. So we can produce 40 slides in 13 minutes. Scan time were eventually reduced to 5.3 seconds per slides. So now we are producing 40 slides, which is an acceptable standard CT routine in three and a half minutes. And now we come to the third generation. That started in the late 1975. Introduced what we consider a breakthrough, tube and collimator produce a 300 millimeter wide X-ray fan beam. Curve detector array become wider than the patient. The tube and detector array are rigidly linked together, but now rotate in a circular path around the patient. All movement is rotational, they're no more transitional. Detector array made up of many detector chambers, allowing for multiple measurements. The detection become more accurate by introducing the xenon gas chamber in the detector array. If you attend this class, I would show you the the xenon chamber and how we used to actually uh, fill and, and, and re-energize the xenon balance. Uh, it will give a great understanding of where we are today with ultra-fast ceramic. Uh, they're, they're a great link in understanding the physics behind it could, uh, could help diagnose image quality in the future. So the maximum of a single rotation is due to interconnection cable between stationary and rotation portions of the gantry. The rotation portion of the gantry made one rotation in a clockwise direction, followed by one rotation in the counterclockwise direction, because we're unwinding the cable. The rotation and the stationary still connected to each other with cables. There was no carbon brush. There are no concepts of sliding or slip rings. This operation called the rotate rotate at that time, or the TikTok geometry. That's a different TikTok than the TikTok we know today. One rotation equal one slide. Scan time reduced to 4.8 seconds per slice. This generation laid down the basics for our current CT technology. We are rotating with wide fan beam. Fourth generation, in 1976, developed under contract with the National Institutes of Health, incorporated a large stationary ring of detectors. Only the tube 
is rotating. Advantages of this design, less rotation, less problem. So only the cube rotates 4.8 seconds per slide, eventually reduced to one second, allows for continuous auto calibration and detector models. That sounds like a big deal at that time. And frankly, that could be even a better deal today. But why we don't have only cube rotating today and all detector elements stationary? Because Lodo's efficiency resulted in the need for a higher number of detectors. Now we have up to 4,800 and eventually to as many as 8,000 detector elements. As a scan time decrease, model count increase, high cost of the detector models, and an increase of the scattered radiation reaching the detector decrease image quality. Higher radiation dose than earlier scanner system. We will learn one thing, the mission of CT invention built on increasing image quality and decreasing dose. So it does not matter how service friendly this design is. It violates the main purpose of a CT is to get high quality image with exposing the patient to the lower dose possible. And then they come up with it with something very interesting called the electron beam. The electron beam CT in 1984. The source of flow electrons is an actual electron gun, as opposed to the traditional X-ray tube. That's required focusing and deflecting coils to direct electron beam to anode, what we call the target ring. X-ray produced via interaction of electron beam and target rings. X-rays projected through patient to stationary detector positioned opposite to the target ring. No physical movement, only the electron beam moved. With all this, why it did not succeed? Achieved little market success due to equipment complexity, service difficulties, operating difficulties, and increased coal, and the development of progress built on third generation technology. Manufacturer, they were already working on developing a breakthrough specifically one manufacturer we will know who they brought up the slip rings to us and the brushes and they build on the third and fourth generation so we can have the ct we have today so the the abct or the electron beam it was like that a stationary detector ring a target ring a patient on a table, a table is a stationary, and then we will be able to shoot an electron beam in order to attenuate rays through the human body. And then we have that acquisition system that collect the data required to produce it. Electron gun, a certain certification required an ex distinctively complex electron beam gun we use in a specific mathematical calculation that make it very expensive to actually be able to serve this and have the right personnel to sell, serve this kind of modality in the field. So, current CT technology or what we call the fifth generation. Mid-1980, build upon third generation geometry Reduced total scan time by a multi slice detector development. In 1989, a revolutionary change happened. Introduced by Siemens, the continuous rotating gantry revolutionized 
the development of the modern CT scanner, achieved by the introduction of slip ring technology to carry power and data between the stationary and rotating portion of the gantry. Significantly decreased total scan time by reducing inter-scan time, the time it took for the rotating portion to scan, stop, unwind, and reverse direction. Current CT technology. We now have continuous rotation producing sequential or stepped scanning. The tube detector made one rotation about the patient the table moved a fixed distance. The tube detector made another rotation about the patient and so on. Today, we still depend the scan, feed, scan, feed movements of gantry and patient table respectively. In 1991, Siemens came up with something called the spiral helical scanning, which is pretty much a continuous rotation for the system linked with continuous table movement. The, the procedure starts with the tube detector rotating, the table moves in a continuous flow, not sequential, not move and stop, not, not scan feed technology anymore. Rather, the table moves in a continuous flow through the rotation portion. Data is collected continuously through the length of the scan. Mid-1990, bundling the spiral helical scan pattern with the multi-channel detector. Now we have a multi-channel detector. Resulted in sub-minute total body scan, sub-second rotational time, 0.5 second or less are the norm nowadays. Reduce artifact due to reduce patient movement because we are scanning faster. The, ta the patient table consistently moving continuously with the scan, the detector channel are multiplied. So when we are scanning sub minutes, the probability of re in inducing patient movement is way less than when we ask the patient to remain stand and still for minutes. It's easier for a human to become, to stand still for a shorter period of time. With all these technologies, in the 1996, we introduced what we call CT fluoroscopy. And the CT fluoroscopy, it's a completely game changer that helped us with a lot of other function that the CT scanner can produce for clinical needs. That allowed for the development of what we call 3D reconstruction and modeling. Remember, we started doing a complete axial that takes 15 hours to reconstruct and reconstruct an axial only. Then we become actually scanning an axial, but produce images and reconstruct in three planes. Then we get the, the actual consistent scan and continuous scanning and the helical studies and the continuous table movement that led after all this to actually enable the CT to do fluoroscopy. Now we have a three plane images and a fluoroscopy. We were able to introduce the 3D technology for CT. So how the CT procedures actually work today. The procedure as it exists today is the patient is positioned on the system table. The x-ray tube and detector rotates in a circular path up to quarter second per rotation around the patient in a, in a perpendicular plane to their long axis. An X-ray fan beam, 1 to 10 millimeter in thickness, is generated and directed from the X-ray tube through the patient and to the detector as the patient table moves through the scanner gantry. The detector's receptors 
measure the attenuated energy of the X-ray tube passing through the patient, creating data packets. The detector electronic pass these data packets to the reconstruction computer to perform this, the calculation necessary to produce a bitmap of the linear attenuation coefficients. Lastly, the resulting bitmap linear attenuation coefficient are compared corresponding to the Hounsfeld unit to produce the final grayscale. Now we can scan and collect data in the axial. We can produce images in axial, coronal, and sagittal. And we can generate an actual 3D image. So the axial was our only hope and was revolutionary to have at the very beginning in the 70s. And now we can produce and actual reconstructed images in three different axes, and at the same time produce an actual 3D image. Why we do have CT versus X-ray? The answer may be is clear now. The CT provide three different plane and images and a, a 3D image, while the X-ray is going to give me topo, not a tomo, a topo image, just a top view of the object scanned. Yes, the X-ray, most of the studies, it's still less dose, less exposure. But the reality, the definition and the sensitivity for the tissue is way higher in CT comparing to general X-ray. So let's look at the images and let's compare. Chest CT scan versus X-ray scan. And I'm actually viewing just the axial chest, just one dimension. But if you look at the way that we are getting details changing window and, 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 and scaling and understanding tissue behavior and looking at bone density and looking at differential tissue behavior it's, and radio density of tissues. You can say a lot and understand more based on the need of the modality, based on the need of the clinical operation for that particular element. You'll see the definition completely different in and CT scan comparing to the chest X-ray. So as the head, head, then you will get the regular topo. Head in the coronal slides, you will get a lot. You'll understand the amygdala, the the brain tissue, uh, uh, if there are main geoma, uh, the the behavior of the neck muscles. Uh, you'll understand a lot about the behavior of the human body comparing to an X-ray. So as in the sagittal, the definition of the tissue, the density, the radioactivity, the actual abnormality, the physical abnormality of every tissue can be read to evaluate the overall health of the patient. So, at Technical Prospects, we help students and engineers around the world to have that in-depth understanding of not just what clinically these machines are capable of doing, but rather close the gap between understanding the behavior of the machine and the image quality and actually become capable of servicing these systems based on clinical knowledge and based on engineering concepts. We do offer different courses in computer tomography, in magnetic resonance, in fluoroscopy, in radiography, in virtual training, NGO, CAF, 
we're capable to have the discussion, start a dialogue with you to support any need you may have in these areas. All instructors actually enjoy cons consistently speaking with engineers and students around the world. Keep it very interesting and exciting to us. So I do have one minute to show you anatomical exam. This is for the, for the fabiola, for the small head fracture. And in the image A, you'll see what x-ray would tell us. Uh, while in the image B, you will see what we can get from a CT study uh, plus 3D construction and make the ortho work and the doctor work way easier by understanding the actual breakdown that is happening uh, to the fabiola. And with that, we can actually repair it and then actually take a follow-up by less dose image to see the healing process. Uh, with that, I have another example. I have this example of a male and I have an example of a female just to show uh, the difference in tissue and, uh, and bone density. Uh, I do hope you enjoyed this webinar and I believe it's time for us to take questions. Thank you so much, Sam, for a fantastic presentation. We do have a few questions that have come in. As a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions, please use the question function on your webinar dashboard to ask those. Our first question, Sam, is as the technology continues to advance, will conventional X-ray images end the need for computed tomography? That's a great question, actually. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, a, I call it futurist question. Uh, as we see the development that happen into the digitalization, to the Internet of Things, um, people often ask if the X-ray image become more defined, uh, why we still need a, a CT scanner? Um, I believe everybody in this presentation now capable to answer this question because the need of the modality, the angulation to see within the human body, we don't get that in the X-ray. The X-ray will always remain topogrammed. So if it's something topogrammed without computation, uh, won't be able to produce a three different axial and coronal and uh, images for us or neither um, produce a 3D image for us. So that would be the answer. Great, thank you, Sam. Our next question is, do you think servicing the CT scanner will be completely virtual in the future? That's another great question, actually. I love this question. I get it when, when, uh, when we teach in engineering school consistently, engineers ask about the possibility of uh, uh, of digitalizing the engineering work. And um, frankly, from being in the industry, uh, just not too long ago, went through 17 hours worth of Zoom meetings, uh, speaking with OEMs and, uh, and, and designers around the world, evaluating the new approaches. Uh, one thing about digitalization, uh, digitalization is great and, and servicing systems remotely and having the capability to pull error log remotely. That's what we are all seeing today and, uh, uh, and be able to do the actual work. But frankly, design systems with robotic capabilities, with six sigma accuracies of the robotics to be able to become maintenance free and things change itself by itself based on remote diagnostic. There are important factors associated with this, which is cost. So we see some medical equipment manufacturers moving more toward module replacement. So they decrease the need of highly skilled uh, 
individuals in the field. But the reality is we're like at least 50 or 60 years away from reducing the cost of such a CT scanner. So as a futurist uh, answer for this, it's possible in the future to see that. But it's, I don't think in our career life, I believe we will, our knowledge remain relevant. Our, uh, our training will remain relevant. Uh, whatever we know, it will be existed for at least 50 more years. And when it fades away, it won't fade away in one piece. It will be gradual changes because the technology adaptations very expensive, especially with healthcare regulation. So whatever you know about replacing brushes and working on tubes and working on image quality and swapping and moving detector elements around to reduce impact of, of artifact, this is all will remain relevant for years and years to come. Thank you, Sam. Our next question is, do you think EBCT will be accepted as the future step for CT advancement? That's a great question. Um, uh, it could be electron beam CT, it could be uh, the solution. Uh, and that goes hand by hand with advancement of technology. If, if the cost of, 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 of um, robotic engineering goes down, if the accuracy of remote deployment of electronic modules um, goes down, then we will see a complete product line of that, if and only if we were able to produce in manufacturing a reliable, cost-friendly, service-friendly electron beam CTs. All right, our next question is, do you think artificial intelligence will be leveraged in, the, in future CT technologies? That's a great question. It's actually started. Uh, that's a fabulous question. Uh, it's actually started. 3D mapping um, uh, using symmetry of the human body in order to reduce dose in a scan. These are technologies we're going to see in the next five or 10 years. Um, the scanner will be there. It will behave exactly the same. The, the, the computer tomography principles will be the same. Uh, however, we will have some some extra to tools just like early 2000 when we talked about care dose and got the introduction to care dose and and uh, biopsy principles and cal scores and all these uh, techniques that's early in the 2000s uh, presented we will see artificial intelligence and we will see um think like like scanners which is they are existed today uh, in a very maybe limited basis Scanners with uh, with a 3D cameras that does mapping and and decrease dose on a human body, maximize image quality, uh, more morphological guideline that could expedite uh, reconstruction uh, and decrease scan time uh, for critical patients. So artificial intelligence definitely will will play huge role to become an addition of the current version of the CT scanner to maximize its efficiency, but it won't become a total replacement anytime soon. All right, our next question starts with a comment of awesome presentation. And then the question is, what is the typical size and cooling requirements for the CT equipment room? All right, uh, so uh, that's an open-ended question. Uh, it's a great question and, and definitely engineering driven. I would say it all will be based on the type of the CT, which version of a CT we're talking about and what 
uh, OEM we are learning. Uh, rule of thumb, it will be ask one question when when you were here, um, somebody asking or, or somebody discussing cooling. Is it a water-cooled scanner or if it's an air-cooled scanner? There are some scanners are water-cooled and there are some scanners are air-cooled. So once we understand which one we are talking about, if it's a water-cooled and air-cooled and the manufacturer, then there are certain guidelines to design that. But there are ways to work around room size. The, the room size in CT mostly to become more uh, safety uh, friendly and service friendly, but it could be designed in a larger room or in a smaller room as, as small as a mobile unit. It's all depend on the structure. So the individual who asking this question could email us at support at technical prospects uh, and we will be more than happy to engage further with them uh, with how we could be of help for him planning uh, his next CT installation. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Sam, for a great presentation. I would like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor, Technical Prospects, to learn more about the products they provide to our industry please visit technicalprospects.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit from the ACI, and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We will be back next week with another webinar. Visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. And